uh, of the agenda. Um, our program is uh, about uh, health and the uh, simple principles that uh, helps helps us to to live uh, a better life. And uh, uh, this program is uh, entitled "Your Health Is in Your Hands." Um, for those of you that uh, missed the other presentations, we uploaded them on the internet. Uh, go to our website, www.romanianheralds.org. There is a section, uh, Multimedia, and uh, on that section you will find all these presentations. Uh, It'll yes. be available on Sunday. Uh, they will be available next week. Also, um, I will give you some uh, cards for questions at the end of the presentation. You already noticed that, uh, that there are books. Um, we may put an order for uh, a book that is uh, interesting for you. Also, uh, Mrs. Joyce Brown. Uh, offers um, consultations uh, with appointment. Uh, the contact number is 647-999-5074. And uh, because we recognize that uh, everything that is good, uh, wisdom, and um, uh, everything that uh, help us to understand these things come from God, we would like to invite His presence with us tonight. Our God and Creator, we would like to thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for uh, this program. Thank you for uh, uh, having uh, Brown family with us and uh, help us to understand the, these subjects that uh, are uh, presented in front of us and uh, help us to, to follow uh, these um, principles that uh, you are teaching us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Every evening we're reviewing these principles here. The title again is Your Health is in Your Hands. No one else can take that responsibility for you. In the scripture, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, we find Paul asking us, What? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you are bought with a price? Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which, is God's, which are God's. Our bodies are Christ's purchased possession. And we are not at liberty to do with them as we please. All who understand the laws of health should realize their obligation to obey these laws. And this is the foundation that we're building on this week. We ourselves must suffer the results of violated law. We must individually answer to God for our habits and practices. So the question is not, what does the world say we should do? What do all the advertising say we should do? But how shall we treat this body that God has given us? So I've been challenging folks every night to try Daniel's diet. For those of you that are not familiar with the story, Daniel and his friends were captured. They were um, children from Israel, and they were captured and taken to Babylon. And in the king's court, they were told that they had to eat the food the king put in front of them. Well, Daniel and his friends were used to this diet of fruits, grains, nuts, and vegetables. And they asked their um, care caretaker to let them try that diet just for 10 days. Well, the king's food was very rich. It was full of meat and pastries and fats and things that would have made them sick. So the caretaker was afraid for his job, but he said, okay, I'll let you try it for 10 days. And at the end of that 10 days, those boys, those young men, were fairer and healthier and wiser than all of the other young people. And so I'd give you that same challenge, even if you just do it for two or three days. Not only will you feel better, 
eating fruits, grains, nuts, and vegetables, and drinking more water, but you will find that your mind is clear, that you're not as tired. And we have one more meeting here and then two more at the, at the church location. You'll find that you understand and learn the things that I'm telling you and hold on to them better. So with that, I just would like to move into our subject for tonight. We're talking about the circulatory system. I really like the, the um, promise that God has given us in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. It says, a merry heart does good like a medicine. A cheerful, happy heart. And so we find that courage, hope, faith, sympathy, love, promote health and prolong life. A contented mind, a cheerful spirit, is health to the body and strength to the soul. But did you know that the opposite is true? Sadness deadens or weakens the circulation in the blood vessels and the nerves, and it also slows down the action of the liver. It hinders the process of digestion and nutrition, and has a tendency to dry up the marrow of the whole system. The marrow is the center of the bones, the, the, other, the next verse in Proverbs there says, a broken spirit will dry up the bones. Same, same concept. The marrow is where our red blood cells are made, and it's also where some of the white blood cells are made. And so you can see that when you feel sad, if you're too tired, if you're exhausted, if you're depressed, it affects not only your circulation, but your liver, your digestion, and your bones. So if you... If you have osteoporosis, find ways to laugh, find ways to think positive, be happy, no matter what your circumstances, and you'll find that your bones will be strengthened, your digestion will clear up, and, and your liver function will improve. There's also um, some studies, studies that are ongoing, and they're continually finding how the mind relates to the body. We used to think the brain and the, the function of the mind was separate from the physical, but they aren't. They interact with each other. The electric power of the brain, promoted by mental activity, vitalizes or makes healthy the whole system and is an invaluable aid in resisting disease. So let me just back up and summarize that for you. The electric power of the brain, the, the firing of the neurons in the brain and the cells, is the best aid that we have in resisting disease. Along with that is the power of the will. The will is what you choose to do. And the importance of self-control. Don't just do whatever feels good. Have a purpose and a reason in your life and choose for health. The importance of the will and self-control in the preservation and recovery of health. Did you know that anger, discontent, selfishness, and impurity takes our health away? But on the other hand, again, cheerfulness, unselfishness, thankfulness should, should be shown, and those are life-giving emotions. So it's very powerful to understand the relationship between our emotions and our mind the choices that we make, and the health that we have. Did you know that it's a proven fact that you cannot recover from cancer until you deal with the bitterness and anger that you've hung on to and it's deep in your soul? It, it's impossible because it affects your immune system and your body cannot fight the fight of, of dealing with cancer when you have those negative emotions. The Bible says that bitterness is the root of all of those other there's an illustration, I didn't pull it up right now, but there's an illustration of that bitterness and all the other things that come with it, like anger and um, unforgiveness. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived 3,000 years ago. He knew that joy had a positive effect on health. Isn't it interesting that it's taken all this time for the medical science to discover that? At the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore, they did a study. They wanted to gauge the effect of um, emotions on the health of the heart and the, and the circulatory system. 
So they just did a real simple experiment. They took a group of people and they, they showed them um, some movies that were funny. They had to laugh. You couldn't help it. They were just so funny. And then they showed them a group of, another group of people, movies that made them really sad. And, and what they found is that it had a profound effect, a big effect on their, on their vessels. Laughter appears to cause the tissue that forms the inner lining of the blood vessels to dilate or expand. And, and I think part of that reason is because when we laugh, we get more oxygen going in our system. And so, but when they saw movies that caused them stress and, and sadness, their blood vessels de lining developed an unhealthy response which caused them to constrict and narrow which reduced the blood flow. According to this article, that finding confirms previous studies which suggested there was a link between mental stress and the narrowing of blood vessels. So, so again, find a way to be happy. You don't have to sit down and watch a movie that makes you laugh, but maybe you need that for a, once in a while for a crutch. But find a child to watch. They're so funny. They do things so spontaneous. And didn't Jesus say we should learn to be like a child? So what's happening here? The results of the study were published in the scientific session of the American College of Cardiology. That's just an interesting point. The lining of the blood vessel has an, the ability to adjust the way the blood thickens or or it secretes chemicals to keep the blood flowing smoothly. So the happiness and cheerfulness has an effect on whether your blood clots too much or not. And again, laughter offsets the impact of mental stress. So our nerves control the circulation of the blood. So by the impression of our mind, confined to the blood vessels, the good effect of the bath is lost. So what she's saying, what this author is saying here, even in the 1800s, she understood that if you wanted to take, someone suggested to you that you should take a nice warm bath to relax, and you didn't believe them, that thought cause the blood vessels to stay too deep under the surface. And when you get in that warm bath, it doesn't work. It doesn't help because of the way you're thinking. It's the same thing with exercise. It's the same thing with exercise. Yeah. Isn't that amazing that the way we think affects what we're doing to help ourselves, whether it will help or not? All this is... All this reaction is because the blood is prevented by the mind and the will from flowing readily and from coming to the surface to stimulate, arouse, and promote the circulation. If you think that the bath will make you become chilly, in the 1800s they thought it was harmful to bathe. If you take a bath too often, you'll get sick. Um, but, but what we know is that the bath will help you and it will help your circulation. So you, you have to think positive. Here's a picture of the heart. Let's see if I, I'm going to step over here just a moment. Let's see if I get my, can, I, can you see this? Okay. These arteries on the outside of the heart are the ones that feed the heart muscle. Okay. When you have a heart attack, usually it's one of these coronary arteries that's blocked by a, a clot or a piece of cholesterol. This right here is the aorta, and this is the pulmonary, let's see, this is the vena cava that comes back from the body, this is the pulmonary arteries. But I just want you to see that those, those vessels on the outside feed the heart. Of course we know that the circulation of the blood is very important. Without it, we would die if the heart is not pumping. The, the circulatory system is like a highway through our body, and it carries the nutrients, the oxygen, to the cells in the muscles and the organs, and it brings the waste, the veins bring the waste back 
and it's circulated through the filtering systems. And everything is supposed to work together. The statement here says that maintaining a healthy circulation is important to overall health of our body. Although there are no foods that are scientifically proven to treat poor circulation, you may find that certain dietary additions bring about an improvement. We're going to look at some of those things tonight. <clears throat> this is a little schematic drawing of that highway. The blood goes from the heart. First it goes out to the lungs and picks up the oxygen-rich blood and it brings it back and goes through the artery and, and it's broken down into the um, smaller vessels and then it comes back through the veins, back into the heart. And of course you can see there that it goes to every, every area, every surface of the whole body. And this is just a diagram that shows it goes from aorta to arterioles to venules to veins and capillaries and then back and around. The, ox the arteries carry the oxygen-rich blood that the heart pumps to the rest of the body. And as I explained, it branches out, gets smaller and smaller, and then bigger and bigger and comes back. Because the arteries carry large quantities of blood that's under high pressure, they are wide and thick. And the walls of the arteries consist of three layers, a tough outer layer, a middle layer of muscle, and a smooth inner layer through which the blood can flow easily. And those muscles in the middle layer of the artery help pump that blood through the system. You can feel your arteries maybe in your neck. You know how to take your pulse there. That's your artery that's pumping. But the capillaries are only one cell wide. They're very thin. They're so thin that the oxygen and carbon dioxide gases can pass through that wall of the vessel and also the, the um, waste and the nutrients. They go back and forth through that thin wall. And you may be wondering, why am I giving you all this details? Well, I'm, you'll, pardon me? I like it. Oh, you like it, good. Um, there's a reason I'm building into something here. So just remember that those capillaries are very tiny and they're very narrow and they're only one cell thick. Jumping back to the Bible, we find in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, Lay up these, my words in your heart and in your soul. In the Bible, sometimes the heart is interchangeably used for the mind. And, and I think it's interesting, and that's why I started with the mind. I think it's interesting that now science is discovering how important the interaction is between the physical and the mental and the physiology. Because what we think in our hearts affects our heart. What we think in this heart affects our physical heart. And it says to bind them, the words of God, on your hand and in your frontlets between your eyes. Okay, so recapping, lay up these words in your heart, meaning in your mind and in your soul, and bind them for a sign on your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, says he to you, but his heart is not with you. Have you ever gone to somebody's house and they said, oh, come in and sit down and visit a while and I'll give you something to eat. But they were really thinking, or maybe you've done this yourself, they were really thinking, man, I wasn't expecting company. I have a lot to do and I wish they'd hurry up and leave. That's an example of this. It's like, eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. What we think in our heart affects how we relate. So the veins don't have as thick a wall because they haven't, the blood is not under as much pressure. And the veins have little valves in them. So especially in your legs, that's important because the those valves act like a sec the muscles of your legs act like a second heart and the blood can pump back up your legs because there's it's a long ways from your heart to your feet and the veins are carrying the 
um, the old blood back, so there's not very much oxygen in them, and that's why they appear blue. When you look at your veins in, through your hand, you can see the blue. So here's a picture of the brain. And as you can see, the frontal lobe is right in the front of the brain. And that's what we're going to talk about here tonight. Do you remember I just read you that scripture that says we should remember those things in the front part of our brain? The frontal lobe of the brain is associated with reasoning and planning. That's where we make our moral decisions. That's where we have speech and emotions and problem solving. And did you know that's where we pray? That's where we meditate? That's where we make our spiritual decisions? It doesn't matter what your religious belief is. That's where you do your spiritual meditation, prayer, etc. <clears throat> we had a... Um, we know of a young man. We didn't know him personally, but we knew of this young man that um, when he was... I think he was in his early adult years. He wrote the song, the school song for this uh, high school that he went to school for, and he was a very godly man. But for some reason, things didn't go right in his life, and he decided to try to commit suicide. And so he took a gun, and he, and he pulled the trigger, but he, he didn't kill himself. He just damaged his frontal lobe. And today, Ever since then, and up until today, he doesn't have any moral reasoning. He, he was in prison for a while because he started fires. And it wasn't wrong to him. He didn't know how to gauge that you know, right and wrong behavior. That's just an example of what can, A famous one is uh, Phineas Gage. He had a spike go through his frontal lobe, and they were, didn't remove it, but they were able to study the effect of of that damage on, um, and it also affected his moral decisions. He became, instead of a godly man, he became immoral and didn't, did not make good choices. The frontal lobe is also involved with problem solving, spontaneity. We, we do things quickly and excitedly. Um, and it was interesting in the studies that have been done, they find that the frontal cortex lights up during meditation. When they put the um, wires on the brain to measure it, it lights up and gets really active. And prayer is a form of meditation. Dr. Neil Nedley says that prayer can be viewed as one of the ultimate activities of the frontal lobe. So why is that important in our discussion tonight? Well, it's because the frontal lobe is very much affected by what we eat and by the circulation. So again, just for review, here's a, a schematic picture, a diagram of the artery with the three layers. And, you can, and then the vein also has three layers, but they're thinner. And then the capillary is just one layer thick. And here's an artist's diagram of the red blood cells moving through those vessels. A healthy red blood cell is round and it has positive or negative charges, and they're supposed to bounce off of each other. Well, remember I said that the capillaries are very small. The smallest capillaries in our bodies are in our fingers, in the low back, and in the frontal lobe. And so those are, vessels are so small that only one of these red blood cells can get down in there. And they they have to kind of stretch out and lay down sideways. They can't go in round because it's too narrow. I know they don't have personality, but it helps you get the picture. So when you, um, when you eat too much free fat in your food, it changes that electrical charge on those red blood cells that you see up here. And instead of bouncing off of each other, they stick together. And so when they get down to those little capillaries, even if only two cells are stuck together, they can't get in there. And they can't, so because they can't get in there, they can't deliver their load. They can't bring the oxygen and the nutrient to those areas. There have been some studies done that show that that's probably one reason why in America we have so much low back pain and injuries from low back, in the, in the low back area, because we don't get the nourishment in. We eat too much fat. 
and we don't drink enough water. <clears throat> Have you ever eaten, a, for instance, a Thanksgiving meal or a fellowship dinner potluck kind of a meal? And then about a half an hour to an hour later, you're just so tired and you just can't think or you sit down in a meeting after you ate and you can't concentrate, you fall asleep. It's, that's why, because your blood cells are clumping together and you can't get the oxygen to your brain. You can't think, you can't reason, you can't make decisions. So just remember that little illustration. It, it's very helpful. Same thing is true if you just drank a milkshake or you, you know, the high fat causes that. Researchers from the University of Maryland in College Park asked evaluated 535 adults between the ages of 60 and 98 years old. And they found that those who have more whole grain foods in their diet are less likely to develop something known as metabolic syndrome or to die of cardiovascular disease over the next 12 to 15 years. Of course, the 98-year-olds aren't going to live 15 years, but you get the point. So what is metabolic syndrome? Well, metabolic syndrome refers to a group of conditions that includes high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high blood sugar, and abdominal obesity, which all of those things together raises a person's risk of heart disease, stroke, and kidney damage. The researchers found that men and women with the highest whole grain intake, which is typically three servings a day, were less than half as likely to have metabolic syndrome as their peers who consumed less than one serving a day. So one of the things that will help avoid that syndrome is to eat foods that are rich in magnesium. And I've put just a quick list up here for you. If you think beans, greens, seeds, and whole grains, beans, seeds, beans, greens, seeds, and whole grains. The um, black beans, pumpkins or squash seeds, spinach, and buckwheat are the highest in magnesium. So I'll say that again. Black beans, pumpkin seeds, buckwheat, and spinach have the highest um, whole grain, um, excuse me, the highest magnesium. Tofu is also a good source, soybeans, a good source of magnesium. And if you choose to take a magnesium supplement, I have a little um, slide here that gives you a recommendation, but there's also magnesium oil, and you can buy that in any pharmacy, like a, a health food store or a health store. Um, and you do, they find that it, when you put the, that on your skin, it's absorbed in, directly into the bloodstream. When you take oral, like a pill or a liquid of magnesium, it has to go through your digestive system and you lose some of it. And so, <clears throat> so we like to recommend the magnesium oil, which is made from concentrated seawater. So here are some suggestions for herbs and supplements to strengthen the heart and the blood vessels. Vitamin C, 1,000 milligrams a day, or you, if you choose, you can take it two to three times a day. The thing you need to know about vitamin C is that everyone's tolerance level is different. And so if you take too much, it will make your stool loose, and then you just back up 1,000 milligrams. So for example, if you're taking it three times a day, that makes your stool too loose, just take it twice a day. Wait a couple of days for it to slow down. Vitamin C has been proven to strengthen the vessel walls, and that's why it's recommended. Magnesium, take 200 milligrams two or three times a day. But remember that magnesium may interact with other medications, so just make sure that you're being safe. And if you have kidney damage, you may not be able to take it. Coenzyme Q10 is an important enzyme for the heart. It's an antioxidant. But again, you, if you're taking anticoagulants like Coumadin or Warfarin, you want to be careful with that. And vitamin E, 400 to 800 units a day. Hawthorn berry is an herb that helps prevent high blood pressure and hardening of the arteries. The dose is 60 drops of a tincture three times a day, 
or one teaspoon of berries and make a tea out of that. Or you can take the capsules 100 to 250 milligrams three times a day. Garlic is our favorite. It strengthens the vessels, it thins the blood, it, um, it's also good for the immune system. And so you, but you don't want to take the medication blood thinner and the garlic together. And I thought this was interesting. I, I pulled this off of a website today um, from the University of Maryland Medical Center. They say that you should consume at least five servings of fruits and vegetables every day. The, the fruits and vegetables have an anti-inflammatory uh, action and protect the heart. And you should avoid saturated fats, alcohols, and sugars, which in all of those things increase the inflammation. We've talked about some of that already in previous classes. And those things w weaken your immune system. Here's another thing that people don't often think of. Did you know that if you wear something tight enough that it makes a mark on your clothes that it's, you're making, um, you're hindering your circulation? So if your pants or your waistband is too tight, your, if you wear nylons or anything, if, even your socks around your leg, if, if it's making a mark on your skin, if you're, some of us wear a bra that's too tight, any of those things will hinder the circulation. So be aware of that. And you need to be comfortable, and you need to um, make sure that nothing is restricting the freedom of movement. There was a story that came out of the early 1900s. In that era, they wore a corset and they laced it up because it was fashionable to have a, a tiny waist, like 18 or 19 inches. And this lady, this young lady wanted to be so nice and have such a nice tiny waist that she cinched her corset up so tight it cut her liver in half and she died. We don't wear corsets today, but that's an extreme example of what I'm talking about. We need to make sure that our, our extremities, our arms and legs, are evenly clothed so that we don't get chilled. Sometimes we wear three or four layers over the chest, but we wear bare arms. And then all the circulation stays in the trunk, the central part of our body, but we, don't, we still have circulation in our arms, but it's not adequate. So um, the comment here is that parents who dress their children with their arms and legs naked are sacrificing the health and lives of their children. We see people running around with, with short pants and sleeveless even in the winter time. And, and I'm not saying that to be critical about the people and their clothes, but just understand that our clothes help us to have equal circulation. It makes the heart work harder if we get chilled. <clears throat> when the arms and legs, which are distant from the vital organs, like the heart and the stomach and the liver, are not properly clad, the blood is driven to the head, causing headache or nosebleed, or there's a sense of fullness in the chest, producing cough or fast heart rate, because there's too much blood there, or the stomach is not getting enough. All right, so what are the top 10 leading causes of death in America? This, this list is from 2007, published in 2010, and that's the most recent one I could find. Heart disease is number one. Cancer is number two. Stroke, which is actually a part of heart disease because it involves the circulation, is number three. So as you can see, the list goes on. But the top three causes of death in the US and Canada is heart disease, cancer, and stroke. And I heard recently that cancer is now number one. So, but it's still heart disease is still up there. Sin. The, these diseases are a result of sin. This is a picture of a gentleman. What do you think his problem is? He's having a heart attack. This is the classic symptom. Pain in the chest, grab it, and find a doctor. Early warnings are pressure in the center of the chest. Some people describe that like it feels like an elephant is sitting on their chest. Or they may have pain in their shoulders going down into their arms. We had a friend that had 
a heart attack, but his pain was in his back. They might only have the symptoms of feeling lightheaded or feeling like they're going to faint or have shortness of breath or they break out in a sweat and feel sick to their stomach with no pain in the chest. <clears throat> Some ways that heart attack can be prevented are avoid the use of free fats or use them sparingly. And by free fats, I mean like the oils. Um, the butter, margarine, cheese, gr fat-based gravies, mayonnaise, it, those are all free fats as opposed to the, the package that God made that contains fat, the nuts and seeds and avocados, beans, grains, all of those things, carrots even have fat in them. Maintain a normal blood pressure, exercise regularly, develop an attitude of gratitude, learn to be thankful no matter what. That doesn't mean, when we learn to be thankful no matter what, that doesn't mean that we um, like everything that happens to us. But we can still be thankful because we can learn from whatever our trials are. We can learn from our um, circumstances that are uncomfortable or people that annoy us. We can learn about ourselves and we can Draw closer to the Lord through those. Don't worry or fret over the things you have no control over. Maintain a healthy weight. Breathe deeply and often. Avoid harmful substances such as alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. Have a dietary habits that are more plant-based than animal-based. Find balance in every area of your life and find ways to reduce stress, laugh, and relax. Before we go on, I'm going to back up here to, the, to these signs of a heart attack. <clears throat> I have a story here I'm going to read to you <clears throat> because it illustrates something different than what I'm showing you here with these signs. These are the signs of an early warning signs of a heart attack. But often women especially, and I think most of our audience here tonight is women, find different symptoms. And so this woman's experience will, t will help you find that. <clears throat> she says, I've, I've meant to send this to my women friends to warn them that it's true that women rarely have the same dramatic symptoms that men have when experiencing a heart attack. You know, the sudden stabbing pain in the chest, the cold sweat, grabbing the chest and dropping to the floor that we see in the movies. I had a completely unexpected heart attack at about 10.30 p.m. with no prior exertion, no prior emotional trauma that one would suspect might have brought it on. I was sitting all snuggly and warm on a cold evening with my cat purring in my lap, reading an interesting story that my friend had sent me, and actually thinking, ah, oh, this is the life. Cozy and warm in my soft, cushy, lazy boy chair with my feet propped up. A moment later, I felt that awful sensation of indigestion. My stomach was so upset, like when you've been in a hurry and you grabbed a quick sandwich and washed it down with a dash of water, and that hurried bite seems to feel like you've swallowed a golf ball going down the esophagus in slow motion, and it's so uncomfortable. You realize you shouldn't have gulped it down so fast and needed to chew it more thoroughly. And this time, drink a glass of water to hasten it, its progress to the stomach. This was my initial sensation. The only trouble was I hadn't taken anything to eat since 5 o'clock. Remember, this is 10.30 at night. After that feeling had seemed to subside, the next sensation was like little squeezing motions that seemed to be racing up and down my spine. Hindsight, it was probably my aorta spasming, gaining speed as they continued racing up and down under my sternum, where one presses rhythmically when you're administering CPR. This fascinating process continued on into my throat and branched up into both jaws. Aha! Now I stopped puzzling about what was happening. We've all read or heard about pain in the jaws being one of the signals of a heart attack happening, haven't we? I said aloud to myself and the cat, Dear God, I think I'm having a heart attack. I lowered the footrest, dumped the cat from my lap, started to take a step, and fell to the floor instead. 
I thought to myself, if this is a heart attack, I should not be walking into the next room where the phone is or anywhere else. But on the other hand, if I don't, nobody will know that I need help. And if I wait any longer, I may not be able to get up in a moment. I pulled myself up in, with the arms of the chair, walked slowly into the next room, and dialed the paramedics 911. I told her I thought I was having a heart attack due to the pressure building up under the sternum and radiating into my jaws. I didn't feel afraid. I was just telling her the facts. She said she was sending the paramedics over immediately, asked if the front door was near me and if so, to unbolt the door and then lie down on the floor where they could see me when they came in. I then laid down on the floor as instructed and lost consciousness. As I don't remember the medics coming in, their examination, lifting me onto a gurney or getting me into the ambulance or hearing the call they made to the hospital on the way. But I did briefly wake up when we arrived and saw that the cardiologist was already there with his operating room dress on, helping the medics pull my stretcher out of the ambulance. He was bending over me asking questions, have you had any medications? But I couldn't make my mind interpret what he was saying or form an answer, and I nodded off again, not waking up until the cardiologist had already threaded the angiogram balloon. That's a, a balloon that they put up through the artery into the heart to see what the problem is. They put in two stents to open my right coronary artery. I know it all sounds like my thinking and actions at home must have taken at least 20 to 30 minutes before calling the paramedics but actually it took perhaps four to five minutes before the call. And both the fire station and the hospital are only minutes away from my home. And my cardiologist was all ready to go to the operating room in his scrubs and get started on restarting my heart, which had stopped somewhere between my arrival and the procedure. <clears throat> Why have I tell, written all of this to you in so much detail? Because I want all of you who are so important to know what I've learned firsthand. Number one, be aware that something very different is happening in your body. Not the usual symptoms like we see here that the men have, but unexplained things. It's said that many more women than men die of their first and last heart attack because they didn't know they were having one and commonly mistake it as indigestion and take Maalox or some other preparation and go to bed hoping they'll feel better in the morning. So I advise you to call the paramedics if anything is unpleasantly happening that you've not felt before. It's better to have a false alarm visit to the emergency room than to risk your life guessing what it might be. And secondly, note that I said call the paramedics. Ladies, time is of the essence. Do not try to drive yourself to the emergency room. You're a hazard to others on the road, and so is your panicked husband, who will be speeding and looking anxiously at what's happening to you instead of the road. Do not call your doctor. He does not know where you live, and if it's at night, you won't reach him anyway. And if it's daytime, his assistance or answering service will tell you to call the paramedics. So do that first. Number three, don't assume it could not be a heart attack because you have a normal cholesterol count. Research has discovered that a cholesterol elevated reading is rarely the cause of a, of a heart attack. Heart attacks are usually caused by long-term stress and inflammation in the body, which dumps all sorts of deadly hormones into your system to sludge things up in there. Pain in the jaw can wake you from a sound sleep. So um, the other point that I want to make along with what she just said here that high cholesterol or low cholesterol, uh, high cholesterol is not a cause of heart attacks. My dad had a heart attack. And it was interesting, and he told me in the middle of his heart attack, he had normal blood pressure and his cholesterol was fine. Never mind that he weighed 400 pounds, but um, he had a lot of inflammation in his body from the diet that he was on and the lack of exercise and this, probably some stress. So. I hope that was helpful to you. That there's a, there is a difference. There's many different symptoms of an impending heart attack, and time is important. So what is an, here are some other problems that we have in the circulatory system. What is an aortic aneurysm? It's a bulging in the wall of the aorta. Um, 
there's a weakness in that wall and because of the, remember we said there's a lot of pressure in those vessels because they're so big and they're so close to the heart, that causes that wall to bulge out and it can cause bleeding and if that wall, sometimes it just leaks out a little bit and the person doesn't feel well, but if that wall ruptures and they bleed, they're gone. It's the end because even if they're in the hospital when that happens, there's not time to get them in an operating room, get everything set up and get them opened up and take care of that. The, the bl blood loss is too fast and too large an amount to survive. Aortic aneurysm can be caused by genetically a weakening of that, of that vessel or it can be things like overweight, hardening of the arteries or high blood pressure. Roger's brother recently, well, let's see, how many, 13 or 15 years ago, he had a triple bypass on his heart. In, he was only in his 50s. And for about a year, he followed a good diet that the doctor put him on, mostly fruits, grains, and vegetables, and veg, uh, fruits, grains, nuts, and vegetables. But he decided he didn't like that. He was used to eating a lot of meat and whatever he wanted to eat and he drinks beer and whatever and so anyway about a year ago now he <clears throat> had been having a lot of discomfort in his legs and in his in his abdomen and he kept putting it off and putting branches to go into the both down into both legs so he had to have surgery for that, and they, they have a way to repair it. And um, he's doing OK. It's, we're thankful that they caught it before it really broke open. Angina is pain or discomfort in the chest area. It can, it can move down into the arms. Um, and it's very uncomfortable. And it's caused because there's not enough oxygen getting to those tissues. It can cause chest pain. Um, I mean, it, it can feel like a lot of chest pain, and it could last for as long as 10 minutes. And it's usually aggravated by exercise. So it's, so resting when you have that chest pain is helpful. One thing that really helps the angina pain in the natural world is cayenne pepper. You can take a capsule of cayenne when you have that angina, and it will help to dilate those blood vessels and get the oxygen going. Hardening of the arteries is um, due to formation of plaque or what we call atheroma. It's a buildup, and I'll show you a picture here in just a moment. The plaque can be composed of cholesterol, calcium, or fatty deposits. That plaque that builds up um, hampers the blood circulation because it's, it's kind of like a garden hose. You need that pathway open for the blood to flow clearly. And if there's any, any um, buildup there, it will, it will slow down the blood and eventually stop it. And so remember I showed you the heart with the arteries on the outside? That when that plaque builds up in those arteries, it keeps building and building until the blood flow is cut off and the, there's not enough blood coming into that heart muscle and it hurts. And that's what a heart attack is. High blood pressure is when the blood pressure, the top number is higher than 140, and the lower number is higher than 90. And it's usually caused by hereditary reasons or unhealthy lifestyle habits, which means what we eat, how we exercise, how much water we drink, also drinking and smoking. So here's a picture. Um, I'm sorry. the. Words don't show up very well, but I think you can get the idea. In this first one, this is a normal, healthy, healthy artery that doesn't have any plaque. And then something happens, a tear in the artery wall or a bruise or some kind of debris scratches it as it goes along. And it, it's kind of like um, this buildup is like a, when you cut yourself and your body sends the blood to clot there and forms a scab over it. Well, that's the same thing that happens on the artery wall. It lays something down there, that waxy substance, to kind of form a scab over that, but it's rough. 
And so it continues to collect debris until, until it just fills that space up until it's almost completely blocked off, or sometimes it is completely blocked off. <clears throat> so inflammation is another reason for that. It keeps that lining inflamed, and it causes like a sore to develop there. In the Bible, in Exodus chapter 15, it says, If we will diligently hearken or listen to the voice of the Lord <clears throat> and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statues, he will not allow any of those diseases that the Egyptians had. This was a promise that God gave to those people that had just come out of Egypt just before they went into the wilderness to wander for 40 years on that desert. Well, recently, in the last 10 years, a group of scientists decided that they wanted to find out what the diseases of the Egyptians were. And so they took a collection of 22 mummies from a museum, and they put them through the CAT scan. You all know what a CAT scan is? And you know what they found? Those Egyptians, over 2,000 years ago, had arterial buildup of plaque in their, in their vessels, like I just showed you. And they had headaches, and they had to gum and tooth disease. They had osteoporosis, they had diabetes and cancer. Does any of those diseases sound familiar to you today? We have those same problems, as this lady said here, because of the lifestyle habits and what we call sin. We've disobeyed the commandments of God, and that, that's the consequences. So I'd like to move on here and talk for a moment about stroke. Remember the first three letters of the word stroke, S, T, and R. This is a little story to illustrate this. During a barbecue, a group of people were visiting the host and hostess home in the backyard, and, and they were having a nice meal. And the hostess stumbled and took a little fall. <clears throat> she dumped her food on the floor on the ground and they she said oh she said I was just clumsy so they picked up all the food she'd spilled and got her a new plate and um, she thought maybe it was just because of her new shoes and she tripped over a brick and she she did appear a little shaken up but she went on and enjoyed the rest of the evening but after or the rest of the afternoon but about six o'clock she passed away and her husband had to call everyone, all of the friends that had been there at that meal, and tell them that she, he had taken her to the hospital, <coughs> excuse me, but that she had passed away. She had suffered a stroke, and nobody knew what to look for. They didn't recognize the symptoms. Had they known how to identify, maybe they could have helped her. A neurologist says that if he can get to a stroke victim within three hours, he can totally reverse the effects of the stroke. They have medications today that help stop that clotting or bleeding, whichever it is that's causing the stroke. A stroke is like a heart attack, but it happens in the brain. And it can either be a clogged artery in the brain or a broken artery that bleeds out into the brain tissue. It depends on the area of the brain that it happens, what the symptoms are. But there are some typical symptoms. So the key is to recognize it, get a diagnosis and treatment within three hours. If we don't recognize it and get that help, the person's brain can be damaged beyond repair. So what does STR stand for? S is smile. Ask the person to smile. When we smile, both corners of our mouth should turn up, but a person who's having a stroke can only turn up one side. So they, they have a half smile. The second one is T. Ask the person to talk and say a simple sentence like, it's sunny today. If they're having a stroke, they aren't able to get the words into the sentence. The, the communication pathway is interrupted. And R is ask them to raise both arms. If they're having a stroke, the affected side, they, they might try, but they can't do it. It's impossible. 
So if they have those three symptoms, recognize it as a stroke and get some help. Even if they only have one of those symptoms, they need help. Another sign of a stroke that's only been recently recognized is to stick out your tongue. When I stick my tongue out, for the sake of the camera, it goes out straight. But when a person is having a stroke, again, the affected side won't work. It's a muscle, and so only half of the tongue comes out. It, it looks crooked instead of straight. So to review, look at the face. Does the face look even? Ask the person to smile. Sometimes the whole side of the face will be drooping. The arms, does one arm drift down or they're not able to raise it? The speech, are, does their speech sound strange? It might sound garbled or they're not able to get the words connected to the tongue from the brain. <clears throat> and if you observe any of these signs, time is important. So this is another acronym to remember, FAST. Face, arm, speech, and time. All right. Moving on, how do we lower high blood pressure? The first step is to exercise. <clears throat> if you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure, meaning your top number is above 140 and your bottom number is above 90, you should look at your lifestyle and start looking at ways to change that. 30 minutes a day can help you lose weight, which can help you lower your blood pressure. But I have to tell you that not everyone who's overweight has high blood pressure, and not everyone who has high blood pressure is overweight. It's just that if you are overweight and have high blood pressure, losing weight will help you lower your pressure. And 30 minutes can be 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes at night. You don't have to do it all at once. And of course, if you have the time, you can do more than that. Step number two is to watch your weight. A weight loss of only 5 to 10 pounds can lower and help control your high blood pressure. It also has other benefits, such as lowering your cholesterol, your triglycerides, and your blood sugar levels. Triglycerides measure the fats in the blood. <clears throat> Sometimes just losing some weight will help lower the blood pressure so that you don't have to take medication. Step number three is a healthy diet. There's an, a dietary approach to stop hypertension was established and tested by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which is what we've been talking about. They just gave it a name. They limit the salt intake and increase the foods that have calcium, magnesium, potassium. It also emphasizes consuming all of these foods, fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and low-fat dairy and meat products if you choose to continue using those animal products. Studies have shown that this diet helps to lower both the upper and the lower numbers, so it brings the whole blood pressure down. Welcome. This is the Mayo Clinic's Healthy Weight Pyramid. <clears throat> we've looked at some, in earlier classes, we've looked at some of the um, food pyramids, but I like this one because it, you can have an unlimited amount of fruits and vegetables. A minimum of three servings of fruit, four servings of vegetables. The next level up is the carbohydrates. That would be your whole grains, your whole grain breads, pastas, cereals, rice, that sort of thing. You need four to eight day servings a day of the carbohydrates. The proteins, three to seven daily servings. And we recommend plant-based protein. Move away from the animal products. I like the saying that says, if it has a mother or a face, we don't eat it. The next level up is the fats, three to five daily servings. And the fats. Again, as the Creator made them in the whole package, like avocados and nuts and seeds, even your grains have fat and your vegetables and your fruits, they all have fat. So we don't need the free fats pouring oil on everything or frying our foods. And the sweets is that little tiny cap at the top, up to 75 calories a day. That's not very much. A cookie is 150 calories, most of the cookies, for example. A milkshake is 500 calories. 
So what is a serving? <clears throat> For your fruits and vegetables, if it's uncooked or raw, a serving is one cup. If it's cooked, a half a cup. And your carbohydrates, a cup is a serving. Your proteins, I can't remember. Your fats is a, a tablespoon if you're measuring margarine or, or oils. A tablespoon is a serving. <clears throat> so you can see it's pretty, most of us eat a lot. If we're eating vegetables or fruits, we eat a lot more than one serving. So here are some of the foods that are helpful for blood pressure, high blood pressure. Pumpkin seeds are rich in vitamin E, and they may reduce the tendency of cells to stick together and clot. Garlic helps to prevent the buildup of plaques in the arteries. And we, we mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier, that it also helps to prevent the clotting of the blood. Watermelon is rich in lycopene, which is very good for the heart. To, cooked tomatoes are also rich in lycopene. And that helps to inhibit the buildup in the arteries. Oranges have a lot of vitamin C, which helps to support the, the strength of the walls, especially in the capillaries. Turmeric, that's the yellow spice that, or, or herb that you see in curries or um, seasonings. <clears throat> According to Food Scout, it benefits the circulatory system by preventing the clumping of the cells. I think we need all the help we can get because we live in such a stressful society. Stress can also make change that ability to clump or flow freely. Step number four to lower your high blood pressure is to stop smoking. Did you know that when you smoke, the cigarette smoke makes the vessels smaller, makes them constrict? And by doing that, it raises your blood pressure at that moment. About 30% of all deaths from heart disease in the U.S. are directly related to cigarette smoking. That's one-third. That's a large number. Smokers are at higher risk for developing heart disease and high blood pressure. So here's cholesterol. Cholesterol is a waxy fat carried through the blood. And we, we know about HDL and LDL, and I'm not going to go into all of that, but I just want you to know two things. Cholesterol is something that we make. Our bodies need it. It's a fat that helps um, build the hormones, and it helps keep us healthy. The problem is, remember I showed you the picture where we get the inflammation or the tear in the lining of the artery, then the cholesterol sticks to that and builds up. When we take in animal foods, the source of our food is animals, like the meat and the dairy, we take in more cholesterol than we need. And when that's combined with the inflammation from stress and the cholesterol we already make, then we have too much. And what do we do with it? So we need to reduce the cholesterol. This is another picture of how that plaque forms when there's a tear on the inner lining of the artery and it starts to build up the plaque and then that little scab is rough and it keeps building, sticking there and building up until, it, until the plaque grows. You can see in this lower picture here and it almost is blocking the blood flow, 90% blocked. And then a and then it's kind of like a pimple. You, you know what a pimple is? So you get a little infection on your skin and it grows and grows until it pops open if you, if you leave it alone. Um, and that's kind of what happens here. It ruptures and a blood clot forms, completely blocking off that artery. This is a slide that shows you that those, those foods that we eat that have cholesterol in them add to the burden on the liver. So here's a common misconception. People say, well, I only eat white meat because there's less cholesterol. I want you to look at this and see, except for shrimp, which is 500, almost 600 milligrams of cholesterol, <clears throat> all of the seafoods, the white meats, and the red meats are similar. They're between 5 and 10 milligrams difference of cholesterol. There's not enough to make any difference. 
So it's a deception that you've been given to say that if you just eat white meat, you're, you're okay. You're not eating the beef or the red meat. So I just want to encourage you to decrease the meat or eliminate it from your diet, and you will feel better. Overeating will also cause our bodies to make more cholesterol than we need. If we don't get enough exercise and we're eating more calories than we need and more fat, we, we not only gain weight, but our whole system is clogged. We get constipated, our blood system get, slows down, our liver is burdened, and then we sit at our desk and work on our computers or we have an office job and we wonder why we can't think and we can't be as productive as we'd like to be. It's because the liver is so burdened and unable to throw off the impurities of the blood and the circulation of the blood is slowed down. If we would change those habits, get more exercise, more fresh air, even if you have an office job, get up and move around um, often, at least every hour or two, get up and take a walk around the desk and once or twice a day take a walk around the building. You will find that your circulation will be improved, your heart will work better, your blood pressure will come down, and you'll be able to think more clearly. Your emotions won't be so stressed, and so your whole body will work better. Again, the overeating cause, causes a dull stupor. That, that's an old word that just means we can't think clearly. We just feel like we've, almost like we've been drugged. and it sets us up to be more apt to have a stroke. Physical exercise is very important. And it's important for us to make those choices. At the beginning of this lecture, we talked about how important it is to understand that the electricity in the brain connects with the physical functioning of our body and helps us make the right choices and it also helps us to resist being lazy. So in summary, you can choose to take charge of your health and avoid these health problems that we've discussed. What we think, the choices that we make, the food that we eat, the activities or lack of them that we choose to do, and what we subject our minds to all have an effect on the health of our cardiovascular system, our entire circulation Remember, you are a purchased possession, you're valuable, and your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and he wants to dwell there. Will you choose health today? I'd like to take questions at this time. Um, you mentioned about the, um, e. Right. And they help prevent the blood cells from sticking together. They should be raw. Pumpkin seed. The question is, should they be parched or boiled? Any of your nuts or seeds are best eaten raw, not parched or boiled or roasted. When you, when you heat the seeds or the nuts, it changes the oil that's in them, and they, they're more difficult to digest. Well, they might. Well, when we put when we put fat on our food, like the roasted nuts usually have, or salt, mm -hmm. it tastes better. We and we become addicted to that salt and that sweet taste. But they're better for us if they're raw. And, we, and when we chew them thoroughly, we get that sweetness that's naturally there. Okay? All right, are there some other... We have papers. People, do you have your question written out? I calcium for osteoporosis, and how does that connect with heart attacks? Um, calcium, first of all, 
this is not a direct answer to your question, but I think it will help you. First of all, there's different kinds of calcium. And the calcium citrate is the most easily assimilated or used by our bodies. There's calcium um, carbonate, which is from oyster shells. Our bodies can't use it. And there's, there's other kinds of calcium that are not as easily used. So we need to learn the different kinds of calcium. And then there's also um, calcium. The advertising tells us that we need calcium from the dairy. But did you know that the calcium in the milk and the cheese actually draws calcium out of your bones? And it causes osteoporosis. They'll never tell you that in the advertising because they want you to buy the dairy products. <clears throat> so how do we get our calcium? If we don't drink milk and we don't, maybe don't need to take the supplements, you get your calcium from your dark green leafy vegetables primarily spinach and kale and turnip greens and wild nettles and some of those dark greens are really good sources of calcium. Yeah, good point. We get our calcium the same place the animals do. The cows that give the milk eat the green grass. So we don't eat grass, but the dark greens have the calcium. And you could Google that to find more, a list of foods for calcium. So does that that vitamin D will help to strengthen the bones. And in the north, where we don't get a lot of sun in the summertime, I mean in the wintertime, um, we, typically we have less vitamin D. The sunshine is a source of vitamin D, and when it hits the skin, the, the ultraviolet rays convert the, um, the fats just under the skin into vitamin D. So if we don't get enough, that doesn't happen. Um, everywhere I've looked about vitamin D, it tells me that I only need to have a small area of skin, like the back of your hand, for 15 minutes a day when there's sunshine. So um, a walk in the sunshine will help you get the vitamin D that you need. If in the wintertime, there's a blood test that you can ask your doctor to give, take, for you that will measure the vitamin D level in your blood. And if you, um, if you need to take a vitamin D supplement in the winter time. OK, this says, I don't take any medication. Can I take magnesium calm, a citrate, a teaspoon a day for poor sleep for a long period of time? Some people find that's a product that's powdered and you can stir it in water. And some people find that really helpful because the magnesium helps to relax them so they can go to sleep. Some people have restless legs or cramps in their legs and feet at night, and the magnesium helps to relax that. But I, if that works for you, I don't have a problem with it. But <clears throat> I still think the magnesium oil is a better method of delivering the magnesium to our systems. If I don't like to exercise and if I force myself to do it, I cannot get the benefit because I don't like it. Somebody made that comment. Now they're ask somebody else is asking the question. <clears throat> I think I covered two points in the lecture tonight that address that question. One is that if you don't like something, learn to be thankful about it anyway. Because there's a connection between the brain and the muscles and the heart. And if we do something that we don't like, it sets up a negative flow of energy in our body, the electrical energy. And so we, ha we just need to be aware of that, and we have to make choices. Sometimes we have to make choices because we know what the, what the direction and the promises are. And then I believe that if we ask the Lord to help us enjoy that activity that we know we need to do, we're talking about exercise here, he will give us the pleasure. Look for things to enjoy along the way. Look for the birds. Listen to them. Look for the different flowers that are beginning to bloom now. Find ways to, sometimes I like when I'm walking by myself, I like to pray and just talk to the Lord. I think of all my friends that I need to pray for or think of 
situations that I need to pray about or ask the Lord to help me solve a problem. Those are all positive things that you can do that will help you enjoy your walk and before you know it, you're done. Your time is... Walking is the best form of exercise. Yes, yes, yeah. After age 65, is it good to take 200 milligrams of good calcium to strengthen the bones? It's probably good from age 45 on up. The older we get and as our hormones change, the older women go through menopause, our bones are changing as well. So I just want to encourage you to continue to eat well, eat things that are, have calcium in them. And if you want to take a calcium supplement, that's, that's fine. But make sure that it's something that your body can use. Um, There's a question here about coral calcium. I'm not uh, prepared to answer a question like that. I would just recommend that you go to the internet and Google coral calcium and see what you can learn about it. I don't know who wrote this question. I'm not familiar with that product, so I don't know. Calcium citrate. I think so, yeah. Calcium citrate is probably a tablet. When dairy draws minerals from the bones, is that also true of raw dairy? Yes, because the, cal the calcium and other minerals in the milk interact with the minerals and electrolytes in our body and pull the calcium. They, it's like they're demanding more calcium, and it pulls it from the bones. Yes, it has to be balanced with the phosphorus and other, other minerals. Magnesium oil is only used on the skin. The question is, is it better to drink it or put it on the skin? You only, it's topical. You only use it on the skin. No magnesium if you have kidney damage. Like what? Kidney damage is when the kidneys are not filtering properly. Kidney stones are another issue. Unless you've had a lot of kidney stones, repeatedly have kidney stones, and there's damage because of the kidney stones, that would be another issue. But kidney stones by themselves are not damage. Can you take magnesium if you have a urinary tract infection? <coughs> it's, bless you. It's probably a good idea to hold up till the infection clears, just because the kidneys are involved with that. Just reasoning from common sense. Does using sunscreen block the body from making or converting vitamin D? Um, I don't know that I've read anything pertaining to that, but I'm going to guess that it probably would prevent the body from making vitam converting vitamin D because it's blocking the ultraviolet rays. When you put the sunscreen on, it blocks the ultraviolet rays. That's a good question. We should find the answer sometime. Those are all really good questions. Are there any others? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I heard you talking a little bit when you first came in, so I'm going to repeat what I know based on a little bit of what I heard there. Iodine is in the soil in, in areas along the coast. But inland, where there's not the seawater, there's not so much iodine in the, in the soil. And so um, iodine is important in our system for thyroid function. And it probably has other functions, but that's what we usually think of. And so that's why they started putting iodine with the salt many, many years ago in the 20s, 1920s, 1930 era when there was so much depression of ability to get food. And there was a lot of people, especially in the um, Midwest, they were getting the goiters on the thyroid because they weren't getting the iodine in their food. And so iodized salt is a good source of iodine in our diet. Seafood, which I don't recommend, is also a good source of iodine or seaweed is a good source of it. 
If you choose to use seaweed, I recommend that you find seaweed from the northern seas around Greenland and Norway and Finland up in those cold waters because there's not as much pollution if, and um, problems with it up there. However, let me just tell you that salt, some of you are going to be shocked with this, salt, iodized salt, in the standard brands has sugar added to it. So you have to read your labels. I recommend the sea salt or Celtic sea salt, but you still have to read your labels. I went to the store one day to buy sea salt for a class I was doing, and I looked at the labels. There were two cans of salt sitting side by side, same brand. One had sugar and the other one didn't. Same exact brand. It said sea salt on it. And I, but I read my labels and one of them had sugar and the other one didn't. So I don't know why they do that, except to say that sugar is very addicting and, it, and so is salt. And when you put them together and you put it on your food, you want more. So you just, you just need to find good sources of iodine, seaweed and sea salt. Now there's a little test you can do. You can buy Lugol's or the little tincture of iodine that you use for first aid for your cuts. And you just put a little bit on your skin. And if you are deficient in iodine, if you don't have enough iodine, your skin will absorb it quickly within five minutes and you can't even see it. So if it stays there for hours, you're okay. You don't need any more. But um, that's a little test that you can do to test whether you have enough iodine. Does that answer your question? Okay. Did you have a question? Yes, I have a question. And we're talking about calcium and calcium. From the soy milk, almond milk, rice milk, oat milk, milk substitutes. Right. Um, and the second part of yeah, it. Yeah, they're trying to put the impression that. Oh, the, okay, the media. Okay, the, the media is trying to convince us that we don't, as vegetarians, we don't get enough. If we're vegan vegetarians, we don't get enough calcium. We don't need as much calcium when, we, when we're not continually drawing it out. So to, to make that a little clearer, if we're eating animal products and dairy products, we have a constant demand for more calcium because we're drawing it out of the bones. But if we're not using the animal products, then we don't need as much calcium, and we can get all we need from the, from the plants. Um, most of the milk substitutes, I believe, are, are fortified with calcium. They add calcium to it. Um, so <clears throat> the soybean by itself is rich in calcium. But when it's processed, maybe, I don't know, maybe it loses some of that, so they have to put some more in. I don't know. But if you're getting a balanced diet of fruits, grains, nuts, and vegetables, you should be getting all that you need. Okay. okay. And the other thing is in reference to the bones, you have to get weight-bearing exercise, which is walking. Just keep your bones strong in addition to the healthy diet. Okay, you have a... Uh, what do you think about cleansing? Uh, like, um, the of cleansing, the because we have so much waste and accumulation before we changed our diets. If you're making, if this is new to you and you're beginning to make the transition to a more healthy diet, it would be a good idea to do some cleansing. If you have significant health problems. Cleansing is a, the first step in assisting the body to recover. Um, there's, there's many good reasons for cleansing, and I highly recommend it with supervision. You have to be not under close supervision of somebody that knows what they're doing, but you have to educate yourself. You can't just, especially if you're sick, you can't just start drinking carrot juice and, and doing cleansing without knowing what you're doing because it at the beginning, you'll get sicker, probably. You won't feel well at the, at the minimum because your body, when you, when you cleanse with juicing and fresh foods, your body is pulling all those toxins into the bloodstream and the, and the, and the digestive system to cleanse it, and so you don't feel well 
and you so you just need to either connect with a friend that knows what they're doing or or talk to me by email or some somehow have some some kind of support yes yeah, um, you do <clears throat> I'm going to answer that broadly because I don't know what your specific need is the first thing you need to look at is your meal spacing you need to eat your last meal at least three hours before you go to bed otherwise your digestive system is working all night and you can't rest and then you wake up and you're not hungry for breakfast the second thing I would recommend you look at is your water intake are you drinking enough water but you should stop drinking water two or three hours before you go to sleep before your bedtime so that you're not up all night there's different kinds of insomnia one kind is I can't get to sleep it takes me a long time to fall asleep the other kind is you go right to sleep, but you wake up and you can't go back to sleep after a couple hours or something. So whichever one it is, it can be related to one of those things. Another thing that's imp that a lot of people do is watch television or work on the computer right up until they go to bed. Your mind can't rest because you've kept it so active right up until it's time to go to sleep. And so, so you need to... Plan your bedtime, and I'm going to make a comment about the time, but you should, if you're going to go to bed at 10 o'clock, then around 8.30 or 9, you should start preparing for that. Shut your computer off, read something that's calming, or listen to some quiet music, take a warm bath, um, prepare your clothes for the next day. Whatever you need to do, your, your body is recognizing that you're slowing down and you're getting ready to lie down and go to sleep. So, well, I would try these other things first, okay? I'm not done. <laughs> um, the bedroom should only be used for sleeping or marriage relations. Some people use their bedroom for their office, and they get up from their desk and go right to bed. Or their bedroom is such a cluttered mess, they can't hardly find the bed. Our bedroom should be a place to go and relax and rest. And so we need to keep it in a restful state. Um, another thing to keep in mind is, um, hmm, I just lost my train of thought. Okay, walking. Exercise will help you rest good at night. So if you walk, a, a quiet walk early in the evening will help you rest better at night. Um, prayer helps you go to sleep. I learned a long time ago that if my mind is so active with what I'm thinking about I have to do the next day or what I've experienced today or if I have a problem that I'm concerned about, I've learned to pray this simple prayer. I just say, Lord, you know what? You're going to be up all night. Would you just take care of this problem and let me get some sleep? <laughs> and you know what? If I believe that, he will. It happens and I can just relax and go right to sleep. The question is, do I think it's wrong to take sleeping pills? I, I think that there's herbal, herbal supplements that are better than drug medications. And, and that, I know that's a vague answer, but things like valerian will help to keep you calm so that you can rest. Um, Valium or other drugs, they, they don't really help you sleep. They just shut some things off in your brain so that you think you, you can rest. So you, so you can sleep but maybe not rest. Usually, my experience has been that people who take sleeping pills, the prescription pills, feel drugged when they wake up in the morning and they don't really feel rested. So here's another rule of thumb. It's important for us to have the growth hormone and it's only produced in the hours of sleep before midnight. Now you might be wondering, why do we as adults need the growth hormone? <clears throat> well, children need it because they're growing, right? But as adults, our bodies are constantly replacing and replenishing and rebuilding. The cells are dying and we're making new cells, and that happens all day long, 24-7. But the growth hormone is required to make that production process most effective. So if we stay, we need to have that REM sleep, the rapid eye movement, and we need to have at least three cycles of that during the night. 
So if we don't go to bed until midnight, first of all, we don't get the growth hormone, and secondly, we don't get that deep sleep where when we go down into that deep sleep, the whole body is at rest, just like you're under anesthesia. And if you don't get that, then you're never completely rested. So the recommendation that I make is that you go to bed between 9 and 9.30 every night and get that sleep before midnight. And so let me just review all what I said. Eat a light meal early in the evening so it's completely taken care of before you go lay down. Stop if you're going to go to bed at 9.30, no later than 10. Plan on that and stop an hour to an hour and a half before your, your planned bedtime and prepare for bed. Walk or get some light exercise early in the evening. Drink plenty of water during the day. Rest your mind with God before you go to sleep. You might find reading something light or devotional before you lay down is helpful. Try all of those things, and if, they're, if that's not helping you, maybe a warm bath and valerian will help you. But the sleeping pills would be the last resort. Just wondering,